Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And welcome to this worship service on the Vine, which is the online campus of the Wrightsville United Methodist Church in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors, and it's my joy to welcome you to this worship service today. Our prayer is that God will bless you, that God will speak to you through this service that you're getting ready to participate in online. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Our opening prayer this morning is a congregational union prayer. And so I invite you to join with me in praying this prayer. You'll find the words on the screen. Let us pray. God of hope, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, you taught us that the worst thing is never the last thing. Help us to trust in you even when we can't see you working. In the sure and certain hope of your love, we offer ourselves to you. May your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it's my privilege today to get to lead us in prayer. Please join me now as we pray together. Holy and loving God, we thank you for gathering us together in your name. We thank you for the promise that you are with us even now, more real than the ground under our feet, closer than our very breath. We thank you that you have promised good things for us. God, we confess that we often struggle to trust you because you don't work on our timelines and your ways are not our ways. But God, help us to live like what you want for us will be better than what we can imagine. We pray for our church. Holy Spirit, fall on us anew. Even now, let us feel you in our midst where we have become stale and stagnant Breathe your fresh air through us. Where we feel overly satisfied with ourselves, make us hungry for you. We pray for our community. Open our eyes to the places where our city does not align with your kingdom and energize us to help close the gap between the world as it is and the world as it should be. We pray for the sick, the suffering, the lonely, the grieving. Jesus, we thank you for the promise that when you walked on the earth, you were a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. 
We pray for those we are particularly concerned about today, and we name them before you now, either aloud or in our hearts. And God, we pray for ourselves. We often hesitate to do so because we think others have it worse. And honestly, we don't like to admit our need. Jesus, free us from the grip of self-sufficiency. Increase our desire for you. Mold us and shape us into the people you want us to be. We give you free reign in our lives. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we move now into a time of reflection and giving, I'd just like to remind you that you can always give to the mission of Wrightsville United Methodist Church through our website, our smartphone app, and the U.S. mail. Let us now continue to worship God. Wrightsville kids, I'm Pastor Julia. Today I have a bag full of some interesting things that I want to show you. I'm wondering first if anyone knows what this is. It has a piece of yellow that comes out and it has numbers on it. This is called a tape measure, which maybe you already knew. Do you know what a tape measurer is for? Well, a tape measurer is for measuring things so that I can see how wide something is, how many inches, or how tall something is. It's pretty helpful as a tool to have. What about this? Does anyone know what this is? This is called a hymnal. And we use these here in church to sing songs. Inside are, is music and words that we use so that everybody who's in church can sing along with the songs. So that is what a hymnal is for. It helps us to sing all together so that we all know the words and we all know the tune. Now, what about this? This is a key. Do you know what a key is for? A key is for opening something, maybe a door, or to lock it so that it doesn't open as easily. I bet maybe you have a key for your house or, or maybe your parents have keys for a car and that's what a key is for. I have one more thing in here. Do you know what this is? This is a teddy bear, or a stuffed animal, you might call it. Now, what do you think this is for? Probably it's for playing, or for holding and squeezing. This one is from somewhere that I got to go on a trip once, and so it also reminds me of that place, which is another thing that it's for. All of these things have a job. There's a reason why they are what they are, and they have something that they can do. So now I have a question. Do you know what you are for? Yes, you! All of us are kind of like these things. There's something that all of us are for. There's something we can do. God made us for special purposes, like praising God. But you know, we're a little bit different than all of these things 
because these just have a purpose. They're just tools. But you matter more than a tool. You have things you can do, but you're more than just the thing you do. You were made to love God and made so that God can love you. You are wonderful just for being you. So today, I want to remind you that God has a job for you, but that your job isn't all you are. Just being you is enough. Let's say a prayer together. God, thank you for making each one of us and making us with a purpose. Thank you that you love us so much. We love you too. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, and grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name's Doug Lane, senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist, and I uh, have the privilege of uh, being able to present today's message to you. We're continuing our series called A Sure and Certain Hope, and our hopeful message today comes from the prophet Jeremiah. We're in chapter 29. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving Lord, we pray that you will once again touch us in our hearts that you will heal our souls, that you'll open our minds to what you would have us learn. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're back in Jeremiah this week. You may recall that Pastor Julia preached from Jeremiah two weeks ago. These words today were initially written as a word of comfort to the Jews living in exile in Babylon. And today we find it comforting in our darkest moments as well. You may recall that Pastor Julia's message expressed a hope in God in the midst of devastation. Jerusalem had been destroyed. Jeremiah was in great pain and despair. Yet the prophet dared to hope. He bought a piece of land in the middle of a war zone. He knew if he waited confidently on the Lord, help would be on the way. Today we hear Jeremiah continuing his message of hope. He's speaking on behalf of God as a prophet to the people of God who have been taken captive by the Babylonians. The people of Israel have missed their homeland. They're now living in a foreign land, that is modern-day Iraq. They wondered if God would ever deliver them. Would they ever get back home? And then the prophet Jeremiah speaks these very familiar words to them. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future. It was a comforting word to the people of God. God would make good on that promise. He would eventually bring healing and restoration to his people. But perhaps you're thinking today, well, that's great for them, but what about me? What about God's plan for me? Three times in this verse is the word plan. What is God's plan for me? I want to hope. I want a future. I believe this is why we love this verse so much. Individually and collectively, we crave the knowledge that God does indeed have a plan for us and a future for us as well. We hope it's true. We pray it's true. We desperately want to believe that it's true. But perhaps you still struggle with it. Does God really have a plan for me? What is God's will for me? I remember doing a Bible study on this verse many years ago, and a woman in the study said, well, if God's got great plans for me, I sure wish he'd let me in on it. I hear you. 
God's will is one of the biggest issues I deal with as a pastor. People constantly come to me desperately wanting to know God's will. They often say, I've got a big decision and I need to know what God wants me to do. Or I'm at a crossroads and I wonder what is God's will for my life. Listen, God's will is not a secret. Discovering God's will is not some kind of existential game of hide and seek where God hides it and is amused by watching us try to find it. No, God deeper, deeply desires for us to know and do his will. Unfortunately, many have the notion that discovering God's will is reserved only for the spiritually elite. They hear friends speak about God as if he's sitting there at the breakfast table, and then they wonder why they can't hear God too. But being in tune with God's will for us is not complicated. We just make it complicated. So in today's message, I'm going to tell you how to find God's will for you and to apply it. And if you're serious about finding God's plan for you, God's future for you, God's hope for you, then listen up and perhaps even write this down. Write after these messages. I'm just kidding. But there is something that gets in the way. Something that complicates our understanding of God's will. And that is the fact that we have wills too. Let me tell you a secret. Quite often people know what God's will is for them. They just don't want to do it. They hide behind statements like, I can't find God's will, when in reality it's more like, I don't want to do God's will. I've discovered as a pastor that more often than not, when people struggle with God's will in their lives, it's a struggle of change or a struggle of pride. Now, this is not always the case, but in most cases, somewhere in our struggles to find God's will is either the obstacle of change or the obstacle of pride. I've been listening to Audible this week to Todd Bolsinger's wonderful book on Christian leadership entitled Canoeing the Mountains. He makes the case that church life today is similar to what Lewis and Clark had to deal with on their expedition to the Pacific. When they set out from Missouri, they believed that the western part of the North American continent would be just the same as the eastern part of the North American continent. But when they reached the Rocky Mountains, they discovered that they could no longer keep paddling upstream. The Missouri River did not connect directly to the Columbia, and therefore they would have to do something completely different in order to reach their goal. They would have to get out of their canoes. Bolsinger is using the Lewis and Clark analogy to make the point that church life in the future will not be exactly like it was in the past. But the part of the book I want to share with you today relates to my point about how the obstacles to finding God's will are usually either an obstacle of change or an obstacle of pride. Bolsinger writes, Even if we agree that we are in an adapt or die moment, the urgency of the situation is not enough. When given that particular choice, 90% choose dying. In a study of those who are faced with exactly that choice, stop drinking or you will die, stop smoking or you will die, change your diet now or you will die, the vast majority chose to risk death. In a world where we now have the technology to do heart valve bypasses and even complete heart transplants, we continually fail at getting people to change the behavior that makes those procedures necessary. As Ronald Heifetz, the director of public leadership at Harvard School of Government says, we have the technology to fix the heart, but not to change it. There are those who fear change so much that they have a spiritual block to hearing and doing God's will. Some are like the poem by A.A. A. Milne, the creator of Winnie the Pooh, who wrote, When I was one, I had just begun. When I was two, I was nearly new. When I was three, I was hardly me. When I was four, I was not much more. When I was five, I was just alive. But now I'm six. I'm clever as ever. So I think I'll be six forever and ever. We're creatures of habit. And we get comfortable very easily. Therefore, we don't like change. Sometimes this can be the real cause of our inability to find God's will. The unavoidable truth is that there is no growth, there is no wholeness, there is no fulfillment, there is nothing worthwhile that happens in this life without change. 
To refuse to change is to refuse the best that God has to offer you and your life, period. Pride, though, can also be an obstacle for many who are struggling to find God's will. When out of control, pride can strip our spiritual gears and put us in a real mess. Pride's what started it all back in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve thought, we don't need God, we got this. And we all know the pain and misery that followed. Too much pride can get us into a lot of trouble. We get so filled with it that we're totally oblivious to where it's actually leading us. This is why it's impossible to live out God's will when we're filled with pride. Pride makes us stubborn to God's will, or it selfishly attaches conditions to God's will. It's almost comical. Our pride causes us to bargain with God. Yes, Lord, I'll forgive this person as long as he apologizes. Or yes, Lord, I'll serve in the church as long as I get recognized for my efforts. Is it any wonder that we have a tough time finding God's will and living it out when we live our faith in such a way? So are you struggling to find God's will for you? Ask yourself, do I have an issue with change or with pride? You might find the culprit. However, that may not help you either. Perhaps you've prayerfully searched yourself and you know that your struggle with God's will is not a struggle of change or a struggle with pride and you're still at a loss. The truth is sometimes when we struggle about knowing God's will, we just have to go back to fundamentals. You ever hear a reporter interview an athlete who's just come out of a slump? Quite often you'll hear the athlete tell the reporter, I just needed to get back to the fundamentals. Sometimes when we struggle on our faith journey and have a difficult time discerning God's will for us, we've got to do the same thing, get back to the fundamentals of our faith. And what are they? Well, would you believe that the answer can be found in the verses just after our main verse for today? Jeremiah continues, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me, when you seek me with all your heart. You see, God's plan is not just a song by Drake. In order for us to truly know God's plan and hope for us, we must seek God with all our heart. All of your heart does not mean you're trying really hard to find God. It means you're seeking a relationship with God. In that relationship, you will discover the hope and the future that you need and desire. Here is today's message. If you want to know the will of God, you have to first seek the heart of God. That's the problem. Many people are after God's will without being after God's heart, and you're going to have a hard time finding God's desire for you that way. Jesus repeats this same message many years later. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question in order to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, Well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Boom, drop the mic. Jesus' answer was revolutionary. He quoted from Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. He said, if someone follows these two commands, he or she keeps the essence of all the law. Jesus is saying, you want the Cliff Notes version of living out the faith? You want me to sum it all up for you? You don't have to memorize all these rules and laws and worry yourself sick. All you got to do is two things and you got it. Here they are. Love God with all your heart. Love other people like you'd love yourself. You do that, you got the law down. You can see the Pharisees' jaws just dropping, right? They had dedicated their lives to pouring over 613 laws. They interpreted them. They debated them. And along comes this carpenter from Nazareth, and he wraps, wraps it all up in one sentence. The Pharisees were so preoccupied with the details of the law that they failed to see the heart of the law. Jesus was a master at getting to the heart of the matter. His answer shows that the purpose of the law is to bring us closer to God and our neighbor. If we love God and love our neighbor, 
we're fulfilling what God desires. That's it. That's the heart of all of it. This is God's will. God's will for us is to seek his heart and be in relationship with him. Out of that, you'll discover God's hope and future. So how do we use this fundamental in our daily lives to discern God's will? How do we seek after the heart of God? How do we discover God's will as we go to work and to school and deal with deadlines and kids and bills and in-laws and noisy neighbors? Well, it's pretty simple. I'll tell you what I do when I'm being smart, at least. That's not all the time. I struggle with my will versus God's will, just like anyone else. But when I actually stop to think before speaking, before making a decision, before choosing a path, before responding in the heat of the moment, before making some important transaction, I ask myself, will this honor God and what's the loving thing to do? 98% of the time, you can be confident about your decisions and actions if you just ask these two questions. Will this honor God and what is the loving thing to do? Remember, we're told to love God and love our neighbor. One of the things I do is ask for God's help before I even begin my day. During my quiet time with God, I say to him, help me honor you today. May my words and my actions be a reflection of love to those around me. Help me seek after your own heart. Let me tell you, when I start to pray that way, it has gotten me out of more trouble than you can imagine. But the days that I'm rushed and I skip that quiet time and I don't ask myself the right questions and I don't spend the time in prayer, my day is off balance. I don't have the clarity I need. It's not as if God isn't with me. I realize God is. It's that my heart has not been prepared. And when your heart is not prepared every day to honor God and to love others, then our days become a journey without a GPS. You can't find and do the will of God if you're not trying to please the heart of God. Now maybe you've been listening to all of this and you're thinking, Doug's just not being specific enough for me. Well, that's kind of the point. Now, are there certain times in our lives when we need a specific direction from God in a very special circumstance? Of course. But most of the time, God's will for us can be found by answering those two questions. Will this honor God and what is the loving thing to do? And you may say, well, there are tons of options to those questions. And you'd be right. You see, so often we think God's will is confined to one thing. But the truth is, God's will is often all of the above. God's will for us is to love Him and love others, and that means God's will can be fulfilled in a variety of ways. Most of the time, God's will is not a pinpoint, but rather a much larger expanding circle. We've got a big God. Why would His will be so confined? Now, there are limits. There are lines and there are boundaries that God does not want us to cross, and he's let us know what they are. But God gives us the freedom to live out his will in a variety of ways. C.S. Lewis once said that all genuine religious conversions are blessed defeats. You want to know the secret to finding God's will? It's a surrendered spirit. This means we must change how we approach God and his will for us. Instead of deciding what we want to do and asking God to go and bless it, we've got to decide to surrender all we are to God and ask Him what He wants to do with us. We put ourselves at the disposal of God. Lord, I want to honor you and I want to love others. I want to be a person after your own heart. Then and only then will we be clear about our Lord's will for our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our service will continue with Holy Communion, and so we invite you to get a piece of bread and some liquid so that you might consume the elements uh, with us. And so if you don't have those, why don't you hit pause on the video, go ahead and get those things together, and come back and join us. 
Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another, praying together. Merciful Merciful God, God, we we confess confess that that we we have have not loved you with our whole heart. heart. We We have have failed to be an obedient church. church. We We have have not done done your will. will. We We have have broken broken your law. We We have have rebelled against against your love. We We have have not loved our neighbors, and we we have have not heard the cry of the needy. needy. Forgive Forgive us, we we pray. Free Free us from joyful obedience through Jesus Christ Christ, our Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you to continue to pray in silence. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And And also also with you. Lift up your hearts. We We lift lift them up to the the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It It is is right right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant, by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ Christ has died. Christ Christ is risen. Christ Christ will will come come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for us. This is the blood of Christ, shed for us. You're invited now to consume the elements that you have in your home. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
All right, our big question today was finding God's will, and we learned that it starts with seeking after God's heart. And Jesus has told us what to do. It's to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. So in trying to find God's will for your life, ask yourself, does this honor God? And is it the loving thing to do? Pretty much most of the time, you'll get your answer to knowing whether or not that's God's will. So I pray that you will find success in that as you continue to strive to be faithful to the Lord our God. So go in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Go now in peace, go now in peace, may the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may be. Thank you.